families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Families Divided TV. Tonight, our guest presenter will be Dr. Edward Crook. Uh, we're really happy to have him with us, and he's going to be speaking to us on refuting arguments against parental alienation as a form of child abuse. In Dr. Crook's presentation, he's going to examine the full range of arguments against the concept of parental alienation as a form of family violence and child abuse. And he's also going to provide parents and family professionals with evidence-based responses to refute these claims. The presentation will reveal popular myths relating to family violence and parental alienation. And it's going to present key findings from family violence and parental alienation research in support of the positions that family violence is not a gender-based phenomenon and that parental alienation is both a form of family violence and a form of complex trauma affecting both target parents and children. This presentation tonight will outline a series of recommendations related to needed changes in both professional practice and systemic and institutional reforms in the field of parental alienation. It will, it will conclude with a discussion on points of convergence between proponents and opponents of the assertion that parental alienation is a form of domestic violence and child abuse, which can serve as a foundation for ongoing dialogue toward needed reforms. This is a very jam-packed, educational, full of meat presentation. So you will want to get pen and paper for this presentation. We're going to have Dr. Crook with us right after these messages. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision-making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being, too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. In refuting arguments against parental alienation as a form of family violence and child abuse, it's important to begin by pushing back against the idea that family violence is essentially a matter of male violence against women. The idea that family violence is equivalent to violence against women. No, violence against women is a form of family violence. A gendered phenomenon and the gender paradigm prevalent in our society is deeply flawed. Although it's important to draw attention to the victimization of women in family violence situations, the assumption that women are most often the victims of intimate partner violence and men are most often the perpetrator, per perpetrators rather of intimate partner violence is false. Numerous studies, including the Comprehensive Partner Abuse State of Knowledge Report, clearly indicate that women and men are roughly equally both victims and perpetrators of intimate partner violence, and that most intimate partner violence 
is bilateral or reciprocal in nature. And women's use of intimate partner violence is not primarily defensive. Women suffer greater injury from intimate partner violence, but this should not negate the injury suffered by men in these situations. Secondly, the current state of scientific knowledge indicates that intimate partner violence takes many forms, including emotional and psychological abuse, as well as physical and sexual abuse with no less damaging consequences. There's a growing scientific consensus that parental alienation is a serious form of both intimate partner violence and child abuse, which is often not recognized, and it's far more common than most assume it to be. Parental alienation involves a set of abusive strategies on the part of a parent to foster a child's rejection of the other parent, and its negative effects are serious and debilitating to children and target parents alike. For the child, parental alienation is a significant mental disturbance based on a false belief that the alienated parent is a dangerous and unworthy parent. Parental alienation also exposes children to witnessing the abuse of a parent. There's no doubt that parental alienation is a form of both family violence and child abuse. Thirdly, failing to note the psychological abuse or failing to acknowledge the psychological abuse that alienated children are being subjected to in severe cases um, is problematic. And also, it's important to note that these kids may also be subjected to other forms of abuse. That leaves children vulnerable, unprotected, and at risk of severe harm. Child psychological abuse is described in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual as a serious form of pathology. Parental alienation also represents a serious form of victimization and abuse of parents who live with anxiety, depression, and helplessness, as well as feelings of victimization by the other parent, the child, and myriad systems, legal, mental health, and school systems that are not responsive to their needs. It's no longer tenable to dismiss the field of parental alienation as lacking in scientific status. To, to say that there's no scientific evidence of parental alienation is at best an outdated opinion and at worst an attempt to deliberately falsify, mislead and misinform. For example, referring to parental alienation as a pseudoscientific concept in a pejorative manner is fake, is false and misleading. With over a thousand articles and books on the subject, including, including over 200 peer reviewed research studies containing empirical data using a wide variety of methods and samples in leading scientific journals, the scientific foundation for the field of parental alienation is strong and robust as reported in the American Psychology Association Journal Developmental Psychology last year, quote, the current state of parental alienation scholarship meets the three criteria of maturing of a maturing field of scientific inquiry and expanding literature, a shift toward quantitative studies and a growing body of research that tests theory generated hypotheses, end quote. About 50% of the research on parental alienation has been published in the last decade, establishing that the field has moved beyond an early stage of scientific development and has produced a scientifically trustworthy knowledge base. Another point is that there are no gender differences in who the alienating and alienated parent is. Based on data from nationally representative sample, fathers and mothers are both perpetrators and targets of parental alienation. The statement that parents, fathers especially, who allege being victims of parental alienation are themselves the abusive parent seeking to deflect attention away from his own perpetration of intimate partner violence is not borne out in the research. A recent study in the Journal of Family Violence in 2023, just came out, found that parents were found to have alienated their children the alienating parents had an 82% greater probability of having a substantiated claim of abuse against them 
82% greater probability than parents who are alienated from their children. It's significantly more likely to find a substantiated claim of abuse against alienating parents as opposed to alienated parents. Moreover, alienated parents have an 86% greater likelihood of having an unsubs unsubstantiated abuse claim made against them compared to alienating parents. Such false allegations constitute a form of legal and administrative aggression, which is also a form of family violence. The charge that courts and legal and judicial bodies disregard or dismiss evidence of intimate partner violence when parental alienation is alleged in the context of child custody disputes is patently false. By definition, parental alienation is the unjustified forced removal or denigration of a fit and loving parent from the life of a child. Well, many of the arguments against parental alienation are arguments against shared parenting as a post-divorce living arrangement. Uh, and uh, as, as in the best interests of children when both parents play an active role in their children's lives. Just as we find with parental alienation when it comes to shared parenting as in the best interests of children, we find a whole lot of misleading um, misleading statements, misinformation, errors, use of science denial techniques, and misrepresentations of the current state of peer-reviewed published, pub published research and scientific inquiry. Here are some of the counter arguments in regard to the attack on shared parent. In, first of all, in the arena of child custody, although most cases of high conflict over the issue of parenting involve no violence, the incidence of violence is significantly elevated during and after parental separation. A very high proportion, fully 50% of first time family violence occurs during and after separation and divorce in the context of adversarial divorce proceedings where mothers and fathers are at war with each other over the caregiving and custody of their children. The adversarial winner-take-all child custody system seems almost tailor-made to produce the worst possible outcomes where parents become polarized when the stakes are high and disagreements become intense conflicts with the potential to escalate into situations of violence. The threat of losing one's children in a custody contest exacerbates conflict and creates violence. In previously nonviolent families, sole custody determinations are associated with increased conflict and first time violence. Thus, the assumption that in nonviolent high conflict cases, shared parenting is not a viable option is problematic. In fact, shared parenting is associated with decreased parental conflict levels. A high conflict case not involving violence has a much higher likelihood of escalating into violence when one's relationship with one's child is threatened by loss of custody. The sole custody regime elevates the risk of spousal abuse in these cases. Now, when spousal violence does exist, it usually involves bilateral or reciprocal violence. Cases of family violence in the context of child custody disputes come in different forms, including ongoing or episodic male violence, female initiated violence, separation and divorce specific violence and psychotic and paranoid reactions. Mutual violence is the most common type with male violence that fits the classic so-called cycle of violence paradigm constitutes only one fifth of family violence in separation and divorce cases. Not all acts of intimate partner violence and contested custody cases have motivations and expressions derived from a structurally derived male assumption of entitlement and need for control. There's no debate that judicial determination of custody in cases of proven family violence is needed. It's erroneous though, to assume that high conflict cases in which parents disagree on custodial arrangements for ch children after divorce commonly involve serious family violence. This places children at risk of losing one of their parents via a sole custody order and increases the risk of family violence in the majority of contested custody cases that did not previously involve violence. In cases of family violence where there's a finding that a child is in need of protection from a parent, 
The safety of children requires that the abusive parent has limited or no contact with children because of potential harm to the children and the spouse. Parents with a proven history of severe violence will need different resolutions. The majority of non-violent litigating parents in conflict over the care and custody of their children are best served in the interest of prevention of first-time violence by a shared parenting approach. On the question of protracted parental conflict, there's no debate that exposure to ongoing and unresolved high conflict is harmful to children. What is under debate is the amount of parenting time that's advisable in high conflict situations. Recent studies have found that not only that shared parenting is not harmful in high conflict situations, not involving violence, but can also ameliorate the harmful effects of high conflict. A warm relationship with both parents is a protective factor for children in high conflict divorces. And the benefits of shared parenting on children's well being exist independent of parental conflict. Shared parenting is beneficial for children in both low and high conflict situations. And shared parenting is positively related to parental cooperation. Comparing parental outcomes in joint versus sole custody families, shared parenting is associated with a significant reduction of parental conflict levels. There's no evidence to support the contention that shared parenting increases parental conflict. And research does not support a presumption that the amount of parenting time should be limited in cases of high conflict, and a high co conflict should not be used to justify restrictions on children's contact with either of their parents. Now, another set of arguments against uh, parental alienation are based on potential harm to women. In fact, the, with the suppression of the idea that parental alienation is a form of family violence and child abuse, the potential for harm toward children and parents, including women and girls affected by parental alienation, is significantly increased. We're harming women and girls affected by parental alienation. There are many so-called champions of women's rights concerned about the safety and protection of women and girls in particular undergoing parental separation and divorce who have fixed ideological positions in regard to parental alienation shared parenting um, and that blinds them to the overwhelming scientific evidence in regard to violence against children and families including women and girls i would draw attention to the following flawed arguments. First of all, the lack of acknowledgement that women are also victimized by parental alienation by their male partners. Failing to acknowledge that parental alienation represents a serious form of victimization and abuse of women as well as men, women who live with anxiety, depression, and helplessness, as well as feelings of victimization by the many systems that are not responsive to their needs is really a problem. Secondly, the lack of acknowledgement of the profound harms of parental alienation on children are well documented, which are well documented, is also problematic. The effects of parental alienation on children include poor self-esteem, depression, self-hatred, disrupted social emotional development, withdrawal, isolation, social anxiety, low self-sufficiency, lack of autonomy, and, and codependence with the alienating parent, academic struggles, failure to reach academic and employment potential, and poor impulse control, struggles with addiction, and self-harm. Parental alienation is child abuse writ large. There's also a lack of acknowledgement that family and intimate partner violence is a criminal justice issue and that women and children are not adequately served by the criminal justice system. Family courts do not have the resources to adequately adjudicate these cases. Family violence and intimate partner violence are criminal law matters and should be adjudicated as such. The lack of acknowledgement that adversarial family law processes and win-lose outcomes in the form of primary residence decrees place women and children at risk, and sole custody is associated with increasing levels of conflict between parents and the risk of first-time family violence, as I discussed earlier. Shared parenting is a bulwark 
against family violence, including parental alienation. The lack of acknowledgement that with shared parenting, the general and divorce specific adjustment of women and children is significantly better on all adjustment measures and worsens sole maternal custody in cases where violence is not an issue of concern is often overlooked by those who argue against parental alienation as, um, as a scientific construct. And finally, the lack of acknowledgement that an allegation of family violence is not the same as substantiated violence is problematic. Allegations of family violence increase when a legal outcome of shared parenting is contested, but these are more most often unsubstantiated. Rates of substantiated family violence are significantly lower when shared parenting orders are made. Similarly, when a legal finding of parental alienation is made, the alienating parent is more likely to have other findings of family violence and abuse against them, not alienated parents. And alienating parents are more likely to engage in legal and administrative aggression by making false allegations of abuse. So to conclude, in regard to countering arguments against parental alienation as a form of family violence and child abuse, I offer the following evidence-based recommendations with respect to the intersection among shared parenting, parental alienation, and family and intimate par partner violence. One, shared parenting is a viable post-divorce parenting arrangement that's optimal to child development and well-being, as well as parental well-being, including high conflict situations. Shared parenting also serves as a bulwark against first-time family violence and parental alienation. We should thus support a legal presumption of shared parenting in contested cases of child custody, rebuttable in cases of family violence as the foundation of family law reform. Second, shared parenting is an optimal arrangement for the majority of children and families, including high conflict families, but not for situations of substantiated family violence and child abuse. We should thus support a rebuttable legal presumption against shared parenting in family violence cases, which is in accordance with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court judges in the position of the National Association of Women and the Law, quote, in every proceeding where there is an issue, a dispute as to the custody of a child, a determination by the court that domestic or family violence has occurred raises a rebuttable presumption that it is detrimental to the child and not in the child's best interest to be placed in sole custody, joint legal custody, or joint physical custody with a perpetrator of family violence, clearly. Thirdly, family violence must be regarded as a criminal law matter and barriers to criminal prosecution of perpetrators of family violence and to, uh, um, be acknowledged, recognized, and recognized. Gender-based family violence is of particular concern in this regard as women are disproportionately injured by family violence and require the protection of the criminal justice system. The law at present does not protect women as it should. In addition, I would call upon child protection authorities to recognize children witnessing the abuse of a parent as a child protection issue and a serious form of child abuse, which requires investigation to determine whether a child is in need of protection and an immediate action to ensure children's safety and well-being. Four, parental alienation is a common form of family violence in contested child custody cases and should be recognized as such by child welfare practitioners, policymakers, legal practitioners, and judicial and legislative bodies. Parental alienation is an egregious form of both family violence and child abuse perpetrated by both uh, and perpetrated by and against fathers and mothers. Four, pillar, fifth, four pillars of intervention are recommended to deal effectively with the problem of parental alienation. First of all, recognizing parental alienation as a specific form of family violence, warranting a criminal justice response. Secondly, recognition of parental alienation as a specific form of child psychological abuse, warranting a child protection response. Thirdly, prevention of parental alienation by means of establishing a shared parental responsibility uh, law as the foundation of family law, a legal presumption of shared parenting, and fourth, treatment of parental alienation, including specialized intervention with children and targeted parents and parent uh, and parent child reunification programs. 
With respect, six, with respect to the development of policies, guidelines, and procedures regarding parenting and co-parenting after separation in the context of family violence, I would draw attention to needed reforms in professional practice in four key areas. Um, I won't detail, I won't, uh, I'll just mention these without going into detail due to time constraints. The four areas are, number one, family violence and education and training of mental health and legal practitioners and child and family legislators and policymakers is urgently needed. This include specialized training in parental alienation and, and its consequences in domestic violence and in trauma informed practice. Secondly, screening for family violence. Separating parents must be able to negotiate safely, voluntarily and competently in order to reach a fair agreement because abuse can significantly diminish a person's ability to negotiate safely and effectively, professionals should never proceed without screening for uh, intimate partner violence and child abuse. The presumption against shared parenting in cases of family violence suggests that few families in which violence is or has been present are suitable for a shared parenting arrangement. Clients should be interviewed separately and in a safe environment to make this kind of assessment. Thirdly, safety provisions in cases of historical family violence where specialized interventions may enable shared parenting. And finally, alternatives to shared parenting in cases of family violence. In conclusion, it's important that all of us in the field of parental alienation are first of all acquainted with the arguments against parental alienation as a form of family violence and child abuse. We need to be open to hearing these arguments and finding ways to address them. Secondly, most of the arguments against parental alienation are easily refuted through the wealth of scientific evidence about parental alienation, particularly the, the large amount of new research on parental alienation over the past decade. Thirdly, we need to actively engage opponents of the concept of shared parenting and invite them to the table in regard to identifying points of convergence and to try to find resolutions to points of divergence. I'll end my presentation with a quick overview of what I see to be points of convergence between those who are drawing attention to the problem of parental alienation as a form of family violence and those who are opposed to the concept. There are actually many points of agreements of, between proponents and opponents of the assertion that parental alienation is a form of domestic violence and child abuse. Sometimes I think that perhaps we actually aren't all that far apart from reaching resolution on this contentious issue. So first, I think we agree that the well-being of children should be our utmost concern in dealing with contested child custody cases. Second, I think we would agree that a key factor in children's adjustment to divorce is the maintenance of meaningful and loving relationships with both of their parents. Third, we also agree that children need to be shielded and protected from violence and abuse, and also from exposure to high conflict between parents in a custody battle. Finally, if it's alleged or if we suspect that children are exposed to violence and abuse before or during their parents' separation, we agree that a timely, thorough and informed assessment needs to be done to determine what measures need to be put in place to protect those children and ensure their safety and well-being. All children, both children of divorce and children in two parent families are equally entitled to these protections protections from violence and abuse on the one hand, and protection of their loving relationship with each of their parents on the other. There's consensus that these are the two key factors in children's adjustment to divorce, the maintenance of meaningful relationships with both parents and protection from violence, abuse, and ongoing exposure to high conflict. There's debate about the relative importance of these two factors, but both are vital to children's well-being, and there's agreement on that. So that's so that, that that's a really good uh, foundation on which to start uh, a discussion between 
opponents and proponents of, of the idea of parental alienation as a form of family violence. We can begin the discussion with this question. How can we ensure the maintenance of meaningful parent-child relationships while at the same time protecting children from violence and abuse? I submit to you that we can do so by means of a rebuttable presumption of shared parenting responsibility, or put another way, a rebuttable presumption against shared parenting in cases of family violence and child abuse. So that's what that's one huge area or a number of areas of agreement. Here's another. We agree that in regard to children and parents most negatively affected by divorce, the system is the problem. The adversarial approach is not working to either children or parents benefit and change is urgently needed as this approach fuels family violence. We should not have to fight a collaborative approach. A collaborative approach is much preferred. We both agree, opponents and proponents of the idea of parental alienation, that we agree that domestic violence and, in, and intimate partner violence is a criminal matter and should be dealt with in criminal court. Both proponents and oppon opponents agree that family violence is a major issue, a criminal issue. In, in regard to family law, although uh, shared parenting proponents on the basis of scientific evidence concerning child outcomes and family outcomes conclude that a legal presumption in favor of shared parenting is, is commensurate with the well-being and best interests of the majority of children, women's advocates have kind of rejected the notion of shared parenting, argued, arguing that a rebuttable presumption against shared parenting best protects women and children uh, who are victims of violence in post-separation families. These two presumptions are typically understood to be diametrically opposed recommendations, and the rights and best interests of children on the one hand and abuse spouses are, are on the other are set in opposition to each other. Well, I challenge the notion that these two presumptions are fundamentally opposed and would say that they're in fact complementary. Indeed, the rights and needs of children and abuse spouses can't be separated and it's in the interest of both that family law establishes a criterion of child custody determination that fully addresses the needs for protection of vulnerable parents and children in situations of family violence, while at the same time ensuring that parents and children's need for meaningful parent-child relationships in nonviolent families is equally protected. So a rebuttable presumption in favor of shared parenting is equivalent to a rebuttable presumption against shared parenting in family violence situations. There are two sides of the same, same coin. Both opponents and proponents of the idea that parental alienation is a form of family violence are concerned about the phenomena of false allegations on the one hand and false denials on the other. Family violence and parental alienation are two, two sides of the same issue. There, there are false allegations and false denials of both family violence and parental alienation. It goes both ways. We need to effectively deal, we need effective mechanisms to deal with both false allegations and false denials of fam family violence and parental alienation. And finally, we agree that the term Parental alienation itself is problematic. We need to define this notion of the unjustified involuntary separation of a fit and loving parent from the life of a child precisely. That's what we talk, that's what we're referring to when we talk about parental alienation by definition. Thanks for your uh, time and attention today, and I hope. Uh, that I might hear from you if you have any uh, sort of I, thoughts, um, either agreements or disagreements with what I've had to say. Uh, I look forward to your feedback. Thank you.
On our next episode of Families Divided TV, Randy Fine discusses the impact narcissistic parents have on their children.